All righty. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in to um, our RTD Accountability Committee meeting. Um, it's Monday the 24th, and we are going to get started. Um, do we want to do introductions and a roll call? I'm going to go ahead and ask our, our Dr. Cog staff to go ahead and go through um, our roll call. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and you want me to do roll call of uh, committee members or everyone in attendance online? We're gonna do committee members. Okay, thank you. Okay, it looks like we have Crystal Murillo, Dan Blankenship, Dianira Zavala, Elise Jones, Jackie Malay, Julie Dran Mullica, Kathy Nesbitt, Kristen Trustman, Lynn Geisinger, Rut Bridges, Sophie Schulman, and Troy Whitmore. Perfect, so we have almost everyone on the call today. Um, let's uh, go ahead and keep moving forward. We have a quorum to go ahead and conduct business. Um, agenda item number three is the attachment A, August 10th accountability committee meeting summary. Um, do we have to get those approved um, by the group? Co-Chair Murillo, I, th I would suggest, um, I think, just an opportunity for any uh, um, uh, revisions to the meeting notes and then just acceptance by the committee is fine. Perfect. Um, has everyone had a chance to review the meeting minutes and are there any corrections? I didn't I need to approve of the meeting minutes. All right, there's a motion on the floor. Second. Perfect. Um, all right, we're going to go ahead and vote to accept the meeting summary as is. Um, do we, uh, this is to the Dr. Cog staff, is there any particular way that you need us to accomplish this part or any sort of voting in the future? Uh, no, ma'am. I, I think uh, probably a voice vote is just fine since you're all, since you're all here and on video. Perfect. Um, well, all those in favor of accepting the meeting summary as written, please say aye. 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 Any one opposed? Okay, approved unanimously. All right, so those were kind of the introductory things. We have some action items. Uh, the first item for discussion is the revision to the RT Accountability Committee guidelines, um, which is attachment B. Um, is there a staff presentation on this? Co-Chair I don't have a formal presentation. We included the um, revisions to the guidelines based on the feedback from the committee at its last meeting. Um, so we are recommending um, adoption of the committee guidelines. I will point out that the adjustments that we made based on the feedback from the committee uh, were to add the, um, the electronic voting provision um, and uh, basically added language that uh, the committee can uh, determine which items they wish to allow electronic uh, voting on and the method for the electronic voting for any times that they want to want to do that. We did not include language about proxy voting. We feel like that's incompatible with Robert's rules. And since there's electronic voting allowed, uh, it felt like the proxy voting wasn't necessary. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so now I'm going to open it to the floor. Um, does anyone have any comments on the proposed um, guidelines? Uh, Elise? I think Julie had her hand up first. And Oh, I'm sorry about that. Julie. That's okay. Hey, uh, so quick question. Should we update under the officers section? Because we still have chair and vice chair on there, and we now have co-chairs. Just a quick update. I think that makes sense. Any other item? I'm trying to pull it up. Any other committee member comments? At least I know you had a few. Go ahead. Yeah, I did. And uh, I should have said at the beginning too, um, Crystal and I is in our co-chairs, we decided to split the meeting. And so Crystal's running the first half and and I'll run the second half, just in case anybody was wondering how we decided to share that. Um, 
there were a couple other things that I had in my notes that weren't included, and I just want to put them out there um, to see if we wanted to add them. Um, there, I think there were five points. I had one that there will be an opportunity for a minority report to reflect dissenting views on any document the committee produces. Two, we needed to figure out the proxy voting issue, um, and, and staff made a point that if we have electronic voting on anything important, maybe proxy voting isn't needed, but we should at least decide that. I think it's useful to clarify that the committee may meet in person or virtually via phone or video conference and that members will be allowed to participate via phone or video conference if they're unable to attend in person and, or don't feel comfortable doing so. Um, the document, the guidelines as written, refers to a meeting room. So I just think it's a little bit, it's it's good to state, say, state clearly um, that we can meet virtually prior to COVID. A lot of bylaws didn't allow that. Um, the fourth was um, we were going to add air quality to the list of topics the committee uh, may consider. And then I think once we decide later today how we're going to deal with public comment, we, we might want to update the reference to having public comment occur at regular committee meetings if we decide in, um, for that to occur. So those are the five things that I thought we missed in the guidelines document. Elise, can you explain the first one, the first comment you said again? I think I didn't catch all that. Um, oh, a minority report. Um, there was a discussion about, so for example, the, this committee is going to be producing recommendations and mm -hmm. it discussed in our meeting that there would be an opportunity for a minority report if not everybody agreed with the majority recommendations, for example. There may be other things as well. Okay, that makes sense. And again, I was just went through my notes and brought up the yeah. issues. Yeah, I recall us conversing about all of those items, um, and I hear you about them not being included. Um, do we want to have a discussion um, on any of the points? Is there anything that's the committee doesn't agree that we should include in these bylaws? Maybe could we hear from staff on whether or not they, they had a uh, reason for not including any of those? Sure. Um, Co-Chair Jones, uh, Co-Chair Murillo, we, um, I explained the proxy voting, um, kind of our, mm -hmm. our thought on the proxy voting. Um, we felt that the air quality issue, the, the agreement that was reached between the governor's office, the um, uh, Legislative Transportation Committee chairs and RTD, included um, uh, a review of the, the state's greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, standards and how RTD will uh, participate in uh, and help achieve those. Um, we felt like there was enough latitude for the committee to kind of dig into air quality issues and didn't necessarily feel it needed to be added to the committee guidelines. Um, I think we, uh, quite frankly, uh, missed the issue about adding language on um, virtual meetings and virtual participation. Uh, I think we can, uh, if you want to include that in the guidelines as part of a, a motion, uh, we can certainly add uh, language and um, that can that can be handled fairly quickly. Uh, the minor the minority report. Um, happy to happy to add that language. I think the only other thing you didn't touch on was public comment. Um, does that need to be in this document? Yeah, I think that's a that's a very good question. I think you just we know that that was an important conversation that the committee wanted to have, so we had that as two separate um, agenda items. We didn't want to presume the committee's decision on the on the public comment. Um, uh, certainly can amend the um, operating uh, protocols to add whatever decision the committee makes around how they want to handle public comment. Okay, perfect. So after discussion on action item five, um, we will amend uh, the guidelines. Right, I can see I, you. Give me one moment. Can I make one other comment? Sure. I, I think, uh, just from the general discussions about the RTD Accountability Committee, I don't I'm, I'm a little concerned that there's no other topics as determined by the by the committee because there may be 
I don't want to say these are the only things that we can look at because mm -hmm. that restricts our ability to say we realize, for example, COVID is a huge issue and we really need to have subgroups focused on yeah. providing information on that and looking at that. I think it, in terms of rebuilding uh, our ridership, COVID is going to be a huge issue. That's a really great point, Brett. Um, I'm going to ask the Dr. Cog staff. So it looks like we're having a discussion on the guidelines prior to two items that might impact the guidelines. Um, are we similar to the discussion we just had on action item five on the public comment protocol? Um, when we talk about subcommittee formation, um, will we also retroactively um, amend the committee guidelines um, to reflect those changes as well? Co-chair Medeo, I might, I might suggest uh, mm -hmm. for your consideration whether you might want to table this conversation uh, for a moment and move on to the other two action items. And then once you've resolved those questions, then we can uh, bring back up um, this item and make whatever, um, include whatever decisions you make on the other two action items uh, with this final action. That sounds like a great idea. Um, anyone opposed to tabling the item um, and bringing it back after we talk about the other two action items? Okay, nope, I'm saying good. no opposition. Alrighty, so um, can we then transition to uh, action item five, which is a discussion on public comment protocol options. Thank you. So um, the committee had um, a pretty good discussion at its last meeting around how to handle public comment, uh, asked staff to go back and bring, uh, bring forward and develop some alternatives, uh, some options for the committee's consideration at this meeting. Uh, we developed three options for your consideration. They're included in um, attachment C of your agenda packet. The first option was basically allow a general public comment period at the beginning of each committee meeting, um, allow up to 30 minutes of public comment, each speaker limited to three minutes of uh, public comment during that period. Um, if there were additional requests from the public to address the accountability committee, time would be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete any remaining public comment. Um, the public comment may also be submitted in writing uh, to Matthew Helfant, our primary staff, uh, to the committee, and um, comments received in writing would be shared promptly with the RTD Advisory Committee um, members, Accountability Committee members. Option, so I'm sorry, go ahead. With a difficult topic and we get, you know, 40 people that want to make public comment, does that imply that we need to extend our meeting at the very end to handle all 40 people for three minutes? Uh, committee member bridges that that is how that that is how this option would would uh, would operate yes you better plan on some long meetings because I'm sure there'll be some controversial mm -hmm. topics. okay was uh, there a third was yeah. there a third option um option option two committee member Malay uh, yeah. was to allow up to 30 minutes of public comment um, with each speaker limited to three minutes of comment. Um, however, the uh, public comment at the committee meetings would be limited to comment on um, items that are on the posted committee agenda for that meeting. Um, again, public comment would be allowed to be made in writing on any topic and any of those public comment, though all those public comments would be forwarded to the committee membership. So. Uh, we have a question from Ms. Avila. Yeah, so I have a quick question. Thank you. Um, so I have a question regarding the public comments that are submitted in writing. Is there an assumption that those will not be verbally read, but simply provided to the committee members in writing? Is, that, is, is that, that is that is that is uh, both of those options. That's correct. Committee members of all that would those would be provided to the committee. They'd be put in the in the next available agenda packet so that they're out there, but we wouldn't read all of those public comments. Okay, thank you. Uh, Elise? Um, I just wanted to clarify that this is just um, what we're deciding on is the procedure for public input on our regular meetings, and this wouldn't displace 
the public hearing that we're required to have on our recommendations, which presumably would last as long as it needed to, correct? That is correct. And then there was okay. a third option? Yes, if you're ready, the third, the third option that we developed was um, basically not allow general public comment at the committee meetings and limit the limit public comment to public listening sessions um, could be as many and as often as the committee decided they wanted to have those listening sessions they could be related to specific discussion items uh, that the committee has had or specific proposals the committee is considering in terms of its recommendations uh, and th so those listening sessions would be chosen uh, by the accountability committee um, the topics might include things like equity like operations service levels um, and again the frequency of those listening sessions would be determined uh, by the committee so those are the those are the three options that we developed uh, for your consideration uh, thank you uh, for that presentation. Um, opening it back up to the committee, what are your guys' thoughts on how we handle public comment? Um, I'll just say I, um, well, let me ask a question actually. Is there any that, way that we might be able to combine some of these things? Um, I'm thinking because this is a volunteer committee that we should um, maybe, it would behoove us to, to have public comment on the current agenda items only prior to the meeting. Um, but there's always a plethora of opinions, um, you know, on what we're going to be talking about. So maybe if the committee felt it was necessary to open up a public listening session, we could kind of decide that as ad hoc. Is that possible to have that combination just for my own knowledge and the committee's knowledge? Um, Co-Chair Medio, uh, yes, for sure. And I, Obviously, the the operating the operating protocols that you all adopt do refer to and still have the charge that the committee was given from the governor's office and, uh, and the agreement between the governor's office and RTD and the legislative transportation chairs, which do require public hearings on any recommendations. And I think there's plenty of latitude here for the committee to schedule any, however they want to structure those public hearings, whether they're public listening sessions, public hearings on whatever topics and however often you believe that's appropriate to do. This really is about how you want to handle sort of a public comment period as part of any of your regularly scheduled meetings. Okay. Um, I think I saw Mr. Bridges first. Uh, Jackie was ahead of me. She's been trying to. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, Jackie, go ahead. That's okay. I, I'm, I'm trying to, to not jump in. I guess I, I do have, um, a concern about the length of the meetings. And so if we are going to be allowing extended public comments, um, I guess, I don't know how, how much I will be able to, to participate in it. I have a standing meeting at 1030 on these Mondays, so I need to be off. So I guess if just, just keeping that in mind, you know, we don't have a lot of time um, allocated for these meetings. So I do think we need to be very judicious. I completely agree. We do not want to have to read in the public comment, anything that's written. I'm wondering if there's an opportunity to have some kind of a portal available for people to make comments um, kind of whenever they want and whenever it's convened to them. And if they, and then that is our responsibilities then to read those comments. It's part of our responsibility as the committee members. And I'm wondering if we, um, since these are being recorded, um, People can look at them anytime they want and provide that comment. I do like the idea of potentially having listening sessions, and I think we may get a better sense on when those might be necessary based on the type of public comment we're getting. But I am very much in favor of limiting public comment and uh, to, um, and I even think 30 minutes is too long given what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Uh, some fair points, Mr. Bridges. Yeah, I, I kind of second that uh, because I, I feel like, you know, if we look at all of the things that we need to, to get done here, uh, it, we, we run a real risk of having to cut those comments short if we don't dedicate a separate uh, discussion opportunity for it. 
outside of our regular meetings. The regular meetings, in my experience, can get really long if you have people, even if you limit them to three minutes, because some of these issues are going to be issues that people are very passionate about. Uh, we're not here to make minor tweaks to things. That's, I think, if you look at what the governor said and, and what the legislators, legislature said, they really want some bigger ideas, and bigger ideas are always controversial. So we need to let people be able to comment on those things, and we shouldn't have to constrain that in a separate, a separate listening session. Sounds like a, a good way to do that. And it doesn't interfere with us not being able, you know, having people drop off as soon as the discussion or the comment occurs. Okay. Um, Ms. Zavila? Thank you. Yeah, I'm, you know, I, I do believe we need to have public comment at the beginning of these sessions. I'm in favor for the current agenda items and really focusing in on that. I mean, most of our work in the transit equity world has um, come from public comments and come from what the community is saying. So that's that's my personal preference. I do think that as we start to dive into our work and get a clear sense of what the public listening sessions are, that we need to explore that um, as an option again, so that we can definitely come into these meetings as prepared as possible. I just want to lift up one thing that um, that Jackie had mentioned around a database or, or something where folks could enter in real time. Uh, public comments. I think I, I would really um, encourage us to at least explore that. My concern with not necessarily reading the public comments is that folks may feel, especially with community residents, may feel as though their voice is not necessarily being heard if it just goes into you know, the, the internet and no one knows where it goes and we may not necessarily read it. And so I just want to acknowledge and recognize that folks, in addition to us, are taking time away from their daily lives to provide their insight. Um, so if we could have a portal or some way that they could provide their feedback, um, that would be great. Ron, did you want to comment on that? Thank you. Um, I did. I don't. I, I just don't want to overcommit on the technical capabilities of Dr. Cog to be able to have something real time or a separate portal. Like we are, we're absolutely um, happy to provide a mechanism for uh, the public to provide written comments, and we certainly commit can commit to providing those written comments in the next committee agenda packet, so that they are out there, so that the public's not just counting on us to forward those comments or package them and email them to the committee members. We can include those uh, written comments in the committee agenda packets. Um, so I think that we can certainly commit to that. In the meantime, we can explore other technology options. I just I just can't commit to them um, and um, kind of the the how feasible they might they might or might not be for us to accomplish. Thank you for that, um, Kathy. Um, I would say I don't know how much detail we have to reach agreement right now. I think that um, as we move forward with the committee and the subject matters that we're discussing that are on the agenda may necessitate having um, more or less dialogue um, from the community. And so I'm wondering, rather than spending a lot of time now trying to rustle to the ground how much time we're going to put on there, that we take it on a case-by-case -case basis and based on whatever we're discussing, then we make a, a call at that point. Julie, did I see your hand? Yeah, um, I wanted to add something to this conversation. I really like option two, um, specifically for the current agenda items. Um, I I do understand that you know we don't want our meetings to extend significantly because of the amount of time that we have. I would be opening to um, maybe knocking down the 30 minutes a little bit, but I. I'm really excited about the listening ses sessions, and I think that the future committee work is going to really help us define what that is. So I want to keep that kind of separate from option one and two, because I think that that's going to come down the, the piping a little bit. Yeah, I, I mean, it seems like option three is kind of always available, um, and that we're really talking about during our committee meetings, the length 
if if we are going to allow public comment, the length and the scope scope of public comment. So um, I, I I echo the comments made by Julie. Um, I mean, do, I think it would be okay if we you know reduce that if if there's some hesitation because again I, I know that there's some real logistical challenges with convening this group. Um, maybe knocking it down to 20 minutes um, and public comment to two minutes per person. I, I know that that's kind of quick, but this really is just a, a, a taste of how, how, what people are feeling. There's going to be ample opportunity to um, comment via email. We'll have listening sessions, uh, but then in the interest of moving things forward, um, I think we ought to consider that as well. Uh, Sophie, did, uh, did you want to make a comment as well? Yeah, I, I will just echo what the two points that were just made. I, I support option two, and I think I don't feel strongly in between 20 and 30 minutes, but I think being able to have a predictable end time for all of us who have meetings right after this, I think makes sense. And then, at, you know, if we have a topic that has an overwhelming amount of interest, that to me is a great candidate for a listening session that maybe we set up in response to that comment. So um, I, th I think we're all sort of circling around that, but that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes, Elise. Well, it feels like we're maybe converging on a consensus, and it uh, and I would agree that the notion of um, option two in terms of focusing public comment on current agenda items. Um, I, I also have a hard stop at 10:30, so I think we, I, we run public comment for the designated time, and then that's all we have, knowing that we can do listening sessions, and to encourage people to to put comments in writing as well. I know as a commissioner, I have to read through every public comment before a hearing. That's standard practice and I think it's a good one. Um, and that will allow people that, you know, cite research and other things that they wouldn't get to in two to three minutes. Yeah, uh, fair point. So I agree, I, I'm hearing multiple folks who are comfortable with option two. Um, let me just ask, is there a strong preference on the committee between uh, 30 minutes and three minutes per person as opposed to 20 minutes and two two minutes per person and I, I just say that at first symmetry um, in terms of the amount of people who can speak. Uh, Jackie? Um, I would suggest we start with the two and 20 and if we find that that's not sufficient for folks then we can we can always adjust but I think okay. if people know what to expect ahead of time They'll read quick or they'll speak quickly. <laughs> or, or they'll send in their comments. I mean, I think That's the most fair. effective comments, frankly, are written. I mean, from they're not as passionate, I understand, but just from a, I'm a dorky engineer. I like the, I can dig into it then. Yes, Mr. Bridges. Yeah, I support that. Uh, I also would say that, uh, that if, they, if they can't do it in two minutes, then basically make it clear in the instructions that they need to provide a, a written comment because we've really got to hold that two minutes and it's hard when someone is passionate about something to say <laughs> two minutes are up but we'll have to do that if we're going to get through our meetings and let everybody speak that wants to yes and is that and um, i still don't think we'll be able to get everybody two minutes <laughs> yeah that's um, the way well, you've been talking for three i'm sorry <laughs> I was teasing him. I said, Russ been talking for three. He's out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get this um, show on the road. It sounds like we have a consensus. Can we uh, take a, a vote on approving the 20 minutes and two minutes speaking time? Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, perfect. Um, all righty. I think this is where we transition uh, co-chair duties. Elise, do you want to take it on? I do. Thank you for running a tight ship, Crystal. <laughs> We're moving through this. So um, th this next uh, agenda item number six is about forming subcommittees. This is probably going to be a pretty meaty topic. And I think, Ron, did you want to um, begin by making a few uh, notes to, for your attachment D proposal? Yes, thank you, Co-Chair Jones. Um, based on the feedback and the discussion at the last meeting of the committee, uh, 
there were three specific potential subcommittees that were that were mentioned uh, that we noted um, an operations subcommittee a finance subcommittee and a governance subcommittee um, the uh, the proposal in front of you um, does suggest creating those three subcommittees today uh, with the with the knowledge that this does not limit the committee's ability to create additional subcommittees at a later date um, should the committee decide that they that they need um, more or getting rid of a subcommittee and combining topics if the committee feels like it needs less um, we took a stab and included in attachment d of the agenda packet uh, some proposed sort of allocation of topic areas uh, to to those three subcommittees uh, just for your reference again this is not meant to be this is not meant to constrain the committee in any way just a suggestion about sort of giving up um, kind of uh, Response, primary responsibility for digging into and evaluating those topic areas that are assigned to, to the committee under the agreement. Um, I will attempt, if it's helpful to the committee, I can share the share the screen that has the three subcommittees and the and the topics. Um, let sure. me just get that ready for you quickly. You should be Thank able you. to see the list of the three subcommittees yes, and the major yeah. topic areas. Okay, perfect. Um, so um, again, the operations subcommittee, um, digging into the ADA compliance and accessibility issues, um, equity in services and equity in a very broad sense, uh, geographic, so social equity, fairs and the like, um, services provided by the district um, and plans and criteria for how the district um, evaluates expansions or reductions in service, and then the district's efforts to address the state's climate change goals. And we know that that will include air quality issues as well. The second subcommittee that um, was suggested was a finance subcommittee to really dig into the financial issues of the, of the district, including the use of CARES Act and other sort of COVID pandemic related funds to support RTD's missions um, and the review of the current audit, including staff management, retention and hiring issues, all of those financial issues of RTD. And then finally, the governance subcommittee uh, to really take a hard look at partnerships with local governments, um, how the organizational structure of the district and the district's role in uh, fostering economic development. Lots of different ways. We're not wedded to any of this. There's, there are plenty of ways to sort of slice and dice these various issue areas uh, to the committees. This was just our initial suggestion for your consideration. Thank you for that, Ron. Let's have some discussion. Jackie, I see your hand up. Well, I just had a question, particularly about the finance subcommittee. <clears throat> Excuse me. Are we? It, it just seems uh, it's very today, and there's not a future element to that. So I guess I was wondering if that was a purposeful decision and why, I mean, whether or not um, we can rely on the existing, you know, with the volatility of sales tax and the dependence on that, I guess, is that, are we not looking at the future financial? Um, Co-Chair Jones, committee member Malay, um, I read the charge that the committee was given fairly broadly um, that, you know, these issue areas were things that the parties wanted the accountability committee to really dig into but weren't limited specifically to these so i wouldn't i would not consider them okay. as hemming you in i think your research your investigations should take you where they lead in terms of coming up with the best recommendations from the subcommittee from the accountability committee uh, for all of the parties to consider okay and so then i guess i would i would at a uh, lobby to the group that we probably do take a look at that is part of the finance subcommittee is whether or not this is a sustainable funding path forward for the organization um, in addition to today because CARES Act is certainly just today and um, 
and the current audit maybe will lead us into some conclusions about what we think makes sense moving forward for the organization. Good point. Rut, I see your hand. And then and that Kat. was also one of our charges is to find a sustainable path, not just solving the immediate problems, but something that would be sustainable for the long term future. And there, there are lots of issues around that, but certainly COVID right now is on everybody's mind, but uh, hopefully it's not going to be with us forever. Good point. Kathy? I would um, make a couple of recommendations. I think that the operations subcommittee is far too heavy. Um, I would perhaps move bullet three um, in terms of the plans for expansion and reductions of service. I would imagine that those are financial questions. So I might move those to the finance committee. Um, and I would also say fair structures that is under bullet two also should be under um, the finance committee. And I, that might alleviate just a little bit of pressure um, for the um, operations committee. Crystal? Uh, thank you. Um, you know, one thing that I've kind of been mulling over um, is how we infuse equity and sustainability in the conversation. Um, I know I, I do see some like uh, line items that specifically address that, but when I think about sustainability and equity, those transcend all of the committees, right? Yeah. And so um, I'd love to hear anyone's thoughts on how we might be able to incorporate both of those items kind of more, more thoroughly throughout the conversation. It should not just be the, uh, the, the charge of the operations subcommittee to deal with equity um, in, you know, in like a very limited scope, because I can tell you that there needs to be equity and sustainability in fostering economic development, um, organizational assessment, uh, partnership with local government, all of the things, right? So, um, you know, I'd love to hear if anyone else has any thoughts on, I mean, to me, I'm not sure how this works operationally, but it, it almost, uh, from like a graphic standpoint, we have the three subcommittees, but somewhat of like an overarching type of committee that addresses sustainability and equity. Because when I think of sustainability, I, I think of the triple bottom line, right? It's not just environmental, it's economic and it's um, social. I think one of the things that the city did really well, <clears throat> in my opinion, when they were looking at COVID um, and they created these committees to review and make recommendations is that they had um, charges of those uh, respective groups. And it could be that in each one of those charges, here are the questions that you need to ask. What are the impacts in terms of equity, diversity, et cetera, um, ADA, and that every committee has this basis by which they need to filter all of their um, decisions by rather than having an overarching because that's a lot of work to try to manage. I yeah. think it's good to have um, that discipline in each of the committees that every decision needs to be filtered through. Kathy, I really like your suggestion. Daya? I was just going to offer, I, I agree with Kathy, you know, when in our work that we did with um, the city and county of Denver around applying an equity lens to Blueprint Denver, we came up with a set of value statements that we then um, any recommendation that we were proposing, we'd then put it up against this value, these, these equity values. I think that would be really helpful for all of our committees so that it doesn't only live within operations because it certainly affects governance and finance as well. I'm gonna just jump in and add my two cents. Um, I think that that might be a good way to go. And we may wanna list out the questions we want each subcommittee to answer and have some of those be across the subcommittees for example, around equity and sustainability. I had a couple of general comments. A, I think we see financial health in the governance subcommittee, and I think that that's too much of an overlap, so I would probably put financial health under finance subcommittee. Um, I would add structure to the governance subcommittee, which could include organizational structure and board structure as well, and maybe that's implicit, but it's not explicit. And then I felt like the operations subcommittee, I agree with Kathy that it's too big, and I might start by splitting off some of the pieces 
from operations. Um, and I was originally thinking equity is a big enough topic that we should s split it off. Um, maybe having um, questions in each subcommittee addresses that. Um, but I also think service plans might be a separate topic since it's so integral to everything as well. What are other comments? And raise your hands high because with a split screen, I can, you have to, there we go. I think I see Jackie and then Kathy, then Kristen, and then Sophie. So I really, really like the equity and sustainability uh, lenses for all of the committees. And I do think that that makes sense as we move forward with the understanding that it's social, economic, and environment is what we're looking at. So I think, um, I would like to see us move forward with that. And there's a part of me that's thinking um, we don't have to decide everything today with these committees is that perhaps the individuals who are interested in serving on them, maybe sit, have a have a separate conversation, more detailed, thoughtful conversation. Um, there is an, a lot of overlap, I would suggest between all of these and, and, and I could see things moving amongst them. So, um, the operations, I do think, is uh, uh, heavy right now, but I'm not sure what I would take out. <laughs> so there there you go. A lot of help there. <laughs> uh, Kathy, were you next? Kathy? I said I'm good. I don't have any questions. Thank you. Okay. Then it, then it was Kristen and then Sophie. Uh, my only comment about under the operations subcommittee as far as ADA compliance uh, we need to talk about more compliance than just services and facilities including paratransit I, I for one uh, see a real issue with the design of the large coaches uh, as far as uh, getting multiple, for example, wheelchairs onto one bus. There's only two two spots on large coaches for wheelchairs. <laughs> Sorry, there's more than us, more than two people that use these services at one time. So what happens when those two spots are full, those people just get passed up. And yes, the driver is supposed to call for someone else to pick up the slack. But most of the times they just wait for the next bus, which could be an hour, could be half hour, hour, hour and a half. Uh, they are also, these spots are, they match the dimensions of the ADA. However, we can't go sideways into these spots. My chair is matches those dimensions exactly. I need to be able to parallel park into those spots. I can't just go sideways from the aisle into that spot. So uh, there are some serious problems with the designs of the large coaches. I think we have the designs for the paratransit, for the accessoride vehicles. I think we've got that pretty much down. However, we need to talk about more than just services and facilities that the district provides. Oh, I, have, I, have, I have nightmare pictures of what happens when there, there, for example, when there are two power chairs on the bus at one time, there are four inches between the two chairs in the aisle. People have to climb either use the rear door or they will climb over on top of people in wheelchairs to get to that front door. And God forbid there be a fire or a riot or something horrible, an accident. There needs to be a better design for the larger coaches. Good point. Thanks for bringing that up, Kristen. You're welcome. Sophie? Yeah, I guess one of the things I'm struggling with, you know, I I see overlap here, and I think sometimes that makes sense. I guess 
I wonder how we're going to report back to the larger committee from these subcommittees to make sure that as we're taking some overlapping issues, you know, service plans are going to impact the financial future. It, all of those different pieces are going to feed into each other. And so thinking through how we bring the committees together, how you get, you know, unfortunately, I, I would love to serve on all of the subcommittees, but don't think that's that makes a lot of sense. And so how we get the information from one subcommittee to the other um, is really a question for the group. Um, I'm not sure I have the full answer, but I think that impacts where we leave overlap and where we don't. That's a good question. Ron, could you perhaps talk about how staffing might work? And then I yeah, said, yeah. we, we definitely, you know, we felt like three committees was really achievable from a staff support standpoint. And, you know, one or two more perhaps over the course of, of the committee's work if, if the committee decides there's a couple of specific issues they really need sort of a subcommittee to, to really dig into i think we were worried about maybe getting beyond five or six kind of subcommittees and our ability to support those subcommittees but uh in in direct uh answer to um sophie's question what we've anticipated is as the subcommittees are formed and start sort of digging into specific issues um, that there would be an opportunity for those subcommittees to report out at each accountability committee meeting so that everyone sort of at least has a sense for what the subcommittees are, are talking about and, and delivering it about. And Ron, would the same staff person be part of all the subcommittees so have some understanding of potential overlap or would you be designating different dr cog staff to different subcommittees um honestly i i don't know yet uh, we kind of we're going to have to see sort of how the, how often the subcommittees are meeting you know i i don't think i don't think we've we've anticipated that sort of the subcommittees start to dig into every single one of these topics at the same time that there's some sequence to them um, and that's really uh, we felt best left up to the subcommittee to the side with perhaps some input and guidance from the whole from the whole accountability committee um, but um, we're going to have to just evaluate that as time goes on co-chair jones to really think about sort of what resources we have to to support the, the subcommittee staff. I think with three subcommittees, um, I would expect that it will be fairly consistently Matthew Helfant with with some support and some backup from me for sure, and uh, we'll bring in others as necessary. Thanks. Julie, you had your hand up, and then Jackie, and then Kathy. Yes, thank you. So my comment actually was in support of one of your comments around the governance committee. Um, and um, how I think that we need to have a, a specific bullet point that just talks about, you know, what does the governance structure of RTD look like, something that needs to be um, included in that conversation. And so I understand that, um, you know, we're, we're talking about the specifics of these, these committees, which I think actually once the committees start meeting, I could see this changing even more and kind of, um, maybe even getting a little uh, more details in, in the bullet points and things that we want to talk about and emphasize on. Um, I do agree with the um, equity comments that were put in, uh, previously and how each committee needs to focus on how their work is applying to equity. Um, and so I, I agree with those structures and I feel like um, there's just so much more kind of conversations that could probably go into each of these buckets. Um, and I, I hope that there's leeway once the committees start meeting to actually kind of have that conversation and talk about um, additional things that need to be added to this document here or have to specify the work that that committee is going to do. Great. I think Kathy and then I'm going to ask people that haven't spoken up to see if they have any more. I see Lynn. So Kathy. Um, the only thing I, I it dawned on me that might be missing is safety of the drivers. A safety aspect. Um, so, if um, we can either put that under the organizational assessment or part of the governance committee, um, I think that would be helpful. Good catch, Lynn. Thank you. Um, just along the lines of Sophie's comment, first of all, in terms of how the, the information gets out, you know, all of these things are are items that are being. Um, discussed and decisions made 
Um, even as we speak, the midterm financial plan is moving forward in the next few weeks. Um, service changes, a uh, little bit of fare structures, um, safety for our drivers and our riders, how we bring them back from COVID, all of those things. So thinking about how um, we can keep you up to speed on um, what's happening at the agency, I think is an important piece. And that may be in, in subcommittees or it may be a you know, a short um, presentation at, at the committees. It's not something we can decide today, but I think it, you would find it helpful. Lynn, can I ask whether or not that should be a standing item of these committee meetings to have either, it could be somebody like you, an RTD board member or from RTD staff to give a quick uh, update of what's happening right now so we don't miss any of those opportunities? I think that'd be great. I think a, a few minutes at the beginning of the meeting to sort of let you know what's being discussed. You'll see some of it in the press or on Twitter, but um, you know, there's certainly a lot more. And I also think that when you get into the subcommittees, you know, we have specialists on all these things, and uh, you know, at least starting with some of that information will be helpful. But I think the, um, a regular meeting report might be helpful. And all right, I see right then Crystal, and then. Dan, we haven't heard from you, or Troy, if you have thoughts, we'd love to hear them as well. Rhett? Very briefly, I, I think ridership and restoring ridership is a critical issue for the finance subcommittee because, you know, if, if we can't solve that problem, then our ability to create a sustainable RTD is going to be very challenging. And there may be input from other committees, certainly, on that subject as well. Yeah, I would think the operations subcommittee would be having into ridership as well. Crystal? Um, I wanted to offer a suggestion um, so that we can all be on the same page. I, I imagine we're not all going to be on each subcommittee. Um, what has worked really well um, in, in Aurora um, is we, we have a, like a matrix for each, uh, well, it, it's up to the committee, but it works really well uh, for our housing committee. So we have um, a matrix, which I'm happy to share, but basically it tracks all of the items that were brought up for discussion. It tracks kind of the originating member requester um, and then kind of outcomes. You know, what was the staff action? Um, has, has this been finalized so that we can really just very cleanly, very easily um, keep track of all of the, the moving parts. Um, so as we start thinking about that, maybe we don't have to decide that today, but whatever final number of committees we have, just our ability to track the conversations. I know we can read meeting minutes, but it's just another way to make this the most efficient process. It's not always clear because People don't have conversations in in like a very structured, logical way all the time. Like we have discussion, and we might start a conversation and end up with the conclusion at a different point, at a totally separate point of the the meeting. Um, so I just wanted to offer that as a potential way to keep us all on the same page. Great, thanks, Dan or Troy. I think you're the two that we haven't heard from. If you have anything to add, I want to give space for that, Dan. Thank you very much. Um, well, I, I'm just getting up to speed, and this is an enormous effort that uh, this group is undertaking based on my initial assessment. Uh, with very little information to go on, I've, I've been trying to review financial documents and so forth. For me, I think one of the most important things to understand is what's the financial forecast for the balance of this year? and uh, for as many years out as uh, one can be provided. It seems like uh, understanding the capable, the financial capabilities of the organization are going to drive a lot of these other topics that will be being reviewed and there will be um, limitations on what can be done uh, based on uh, how much funding there is available to do those things. I'd also really be interested in the organizational assessment and understanding how the organization is doing right now under COVID-19. Uh, the Royal Transportation Authority has got about 365 employees during the peak season. And uh, COVID-19 is not business as usual. I mean, it, 
is very disruptive and it's a, a ever changing um, situation. Uh, understanding how RTD is responding to COVID-19 and how it's impacting its work, workforce, I think would really be important to understand. Uh, we have people out that are testing positive, people who have symptoms but don't test positive, people who've been exposed. And at the same time, we're an essential service. So um, we don't have the luxury of sitting home, all of us like I am now, uh, working remotely. We have people on the front lines and uh, they need to be protected. And uh, I don't know if RTD has any statistics like we keep about the number of absences and where people are in that process. Uh, but I think that would be helpful to understand because their service plan right now is uh, constrained. If it's anything like ours, it's taking three times the number of bus operators and buses to provide about 30% of the service. And I don't think anybody knows exactly how long this situation is going to continue into the future. And at some point, um, right now we're planning for the winter season and uh, we have to staff up with about 60 more bus operators and it's really challenging to, to, to train people under uh, COVID-19 social distancing requirements and so forth. So, and I can just imagine um, if I was having a uh, Roaring Fork Transportation Authority Accountability Committee looking into my operations at the same time I'm trying to combat and uh, survive COVID-19, it, it might be very stressful on the organization, but yeah. those are the things that I would look at first. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to just check in with Troy. No pressure, but if you yeah. had um, any comments and then I'll, I'll uh, Jackie's after that, and then I'm going to try to bring this conversation to a conclusion. Troy? Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, wow. To, to just kind of follow up from Lynn and then Dan, uh, a lot of the things that he mentioned, uh, we are in the throes of, of multiple challenges, as Lynn said, as we speak. and very, very active this week. Another meeting later today, several tomorrow, later in the week. So uh, I think there are a number of reports, there are a number of experts, there are a number of studies that have been done or are being done that will be very helpful to you. And uh, while we have a number of our office staff being furloughed the rest of the year, you know, it just seems like let us get you those types of information pieces uh, before we reinvent the wheel, because I think a lot of it, Lynn, is, is out there and it's very helpful and it's very timely. So I'd echo Lynn's uh, comments and we, we stand ready to help, you know, however we can. Thank you for the time, Madam Chair. Thank you, Troy. Okay, I'm going to hear from Jackie and then I'm going to see if we can reach consensus on next steps here. Jackie? So I think I'm, I'm leading into what you're going to be doing, Elise, because that was I was looking. We've got a half an hour left. We have not even had our informational uh, presentations yet. So I think I, I guess what I was going to ask the, the body, if everyone would be willing to correspond with Dr. Cog, let them know what committees that we might be interested in serving on. And then I, I think if we can get those committee meetings scheduled, I'd love to have these great conversations that we uh kind of individualized under the operations finance and governance and let those folks get together and decide what they think makes sense and then bring that back at the next meeting if that makes sense to everybody else thanks for that and, uh, uh, let me just build on that to see if there it sounds like people are generally okay with starting with these three subcommittees recognizing operations in particular is pretty big so we may need just to, to create more um that we want to perhaps um, when you're flushing out what the focus is of each subcommittee, maybe we should do it in the form of questions that the subcommittees want to answer. And each of the subcommittee will include a question around um, equity and sustainability. Um, and then uh, Dr. Cogstaff can bring that back to us and we can look it over and see if that makes sense. Um, does that seem like a good next step with these subcommittees? And hopefully, I, I've been taking notes, um, hopefully Ron has been too, on um, 
some of the initial um, adjustments we want, might want to make in the subcommittee's um, purpose uh, when they first meet up. Does that generally feel right in terms of where we want to head? Thoughts? Talk to me. Is anybody not in agreement with, with heading in that direction? And Ron, do you feel like you have a sense of where we're going then? Does that feel workable? It, it, it does, Co-Chair Jones. So um, we, I think we would like some action from the Accountability Committee to create the three subcommittees. Um, our intent was not to, I don't, and I don't believe that the committee needs to say exactly these are all the, these are the things that each subcommittee is going to dig into. I think this gives you a sense. I've taken some notes. I'll, I'll circle back and make sure that because I'm, I'm, I'm certain I didn't capture every single detail. Um, but I think if we can, if we get agreement from the accountability committee this morning to create these three subcommittees, we'll, we'll put a question out to the committee members uh, for volunteers um, on preferences for which subcommittee you would be interested or willing to serve on. And then we'll get those first initial meetings scheduled and kind of do some refinement on specific issue areas or topics for the subcommittees to dig into to bring back to the to the committee. Just two more notes. I think we're going to want to choose leaders for each of these subcommittees to help facilitate, um, which could be a part of the initial meetings of subcommittees. And also, I think we agreed earlier that we might want to bring um, outside subject matter experts into subcommittee membership or to make presentations. So be thinking about that as well. So with that, I think then a motion. Dave, do I see your hand up? Yeah, I just I I just have a comment regarding the equity piece. I wonder if what we could do, not necessarily establishing a separate uh, subcommittee to work on equity, but rather a quick working group similar to what we're doing on the um, to find potential consultants. I just want to offer that as a potential suggestion because the last thing I would want is for equity just be thrown in and not have the the thought that really needs to go into to building that framework for all of us. Could you say a bit more about what what that, what's the difference between a quick working group and a subcommittee? Yeah, so my thinking with the working group is that this group would really design the value statements for each of the respective uh, committees to then take as they're building out and fleshing out their work. So their purpose would be very short term. It's not something that would um, live through the remainder of this overall committee's time. Okay, thoughts on that, Julie? And we're going to need to move pretty quickly because we are behind okay. schedule now. Very quickly, I really agree with that, and I think it really gives us, it allows us the opportunity to be very intentional about the equity work that we've already discussed, so versus just kind of sprinkling it around, I really want this to be an intentional um, task that we accomplish. Does anybody disagree with that? I don't, I mean, maybe it's a, a meeting or two, and... And that work could happen pretty quickly, is what I'm hearing. Any? So, I I guess I'm yes. just. I guess I I thought I think equity belongs in everything that this accountability committee does, and I I guess I I thought equity was going to be viewed under the lens of at least these three subcommittees. So it, I guess I'm trying to understand: is this equity working group going to tell each of the subcommittees what they're going to do regarding? Yes equity under operations and equity under finance and equity under governance or should I, I, would have, I mean I think there are several of us on this call who spend a lot of time and I in equity and in uh, DNI in general right yeah and so I don't I don't when I have seen um, the work in DNI uh, work best is not when it's by itself, not when it's a committee, it's when it's embedded in the work that we do. And so I would strongly encourage us to make sure that it's a part of every one of the subcommittees, but not a separate standalone. People who are gonna be on that committee are the people who do that work, that's us, right? Like, know that work. So I don't think that we need to have a committee of, our, of, of, of similar minds. I feel like, I feel strongly about embedding it in every one of these committees. So what I think I hear, being said is maybe we shouldn't even talk about establishing a working group or or anything but 
volunteers to work with Dr. Codd's staff on crafting the equity question that all three subcommittees need to be <clears throat> answering because we've already decided it is it's it's a lens that will um, uh, encompass all of our work. How do you put that in in writing? You don't have to reinvent the wheel, um, but some people could volunteer to help us put that in writing. Perhaps is what we're looking for. Day, is that get to where you were talking about? Yes. Crystal, did you have your hand up? Yep, I I am okay with that recommendation. Okay, so we do need to move along on. I think we could entertain a motion to establish three subcommittees for the time being, the governance, operations, and finance subcommittees. And um and then we'll ask for volunteers on helping craft that equity statement. So moved. John, did you want, you wanted a motion, correct? Okay. Yes, please. Second. So moved. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, and then just real show of hands, um, who would like to volunteer to, to meet in the near future to help craft that equity? Question statement. I, I um, it works on my calendar, but if not, I will send what the questions that I have that came from the city. Okay, I see Dave, Crystal, and Julie, and Jackie. And Kathy, at least informationally, will provide input. Awesome. Okay, let's let's quickly move then um, to our informational briefing. Well, we actually should probably circle back quickly to the guidelines because that's the um, action item. Based on our conversation now, it sounded like the um, we could add this statement around public comments that we will have a, and I think we can keep it loose so that we can change it from 20 minutes to 30 minutes if we need to, that kind of thing. Um, add that we have the ability to, to form subcommittees and include outside subject matter expertise. Um, the other points that we had flagged earlier, a minority report, virtual meetings and participation, and our ability to add other issues um, as defined. I would include air quality because we're going to severe non-attainment, but that's just me. Um, and um, the document might clarify that we have we have uh, decided leadership in co-chair fashion. Are there any other changes to the guidelines that I've missed? So I guess the question, Ron, do you want us to vote on that today or will you bring that back to us? Co-chair Jones, um, I would here, here's what I would um, suggest for your consideration. Um, with those noted changes, if you can give us some latitude to include the language in the in the committee guidelines, uh, we will do that. If you want to act on though on that today with with those changes, um, we'll bring that back to you so that you can see them at your next meeting. But it might be helpful to to go ahead and act on those with with those changes included. We'll, we'll draft up that language. We'll make sure you see that at your next meeting to make sure we captured it and give you a chance to revisit if we didn't. Um, but it, I think it would be helpful if you could if you could adopt the committee guidelines today. So if people are in agreement, then I would entertain a motion to conceptually approve the guidelines as amended in our discussion just now. So moved. So, that second. was Jackie. Second. I heard Kathy second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? We have guidelines. All right, now on to our informational briefings. Um, we will have a quick briefing on Reimagine RTD from Bill Van Meter. Bill, are you with us? <clears throat> he is. I just need to bring him over real quick. So, oh, there we go. And Bill, I am sorry that we sort of ate into your time. This will need to be a rather brief overview. My apologies. Understood. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you see my screen that I'm trying to share? Yep. Yes. yes. 
awesome. Then I can make this as uh, brief as necessary. Wanted to give you this update on the reimagined RTD two-year planning effort that we are in the midst of right now. Many of the folks on this um, call today and on the accountability committee have either been following what's going on with Reimagine RTD or are on our advisory um, and um, committees. So it'll be familiar with you or to you what I am discussing. So when we embarked on this just last year, RTD's ridership was 340 to 350,000 people a day. We had 340 to 350,000 boardings a day, and we were struggling to. Um, hire enough operators for our rail and our bus services, as well as mechanics um, to, to meet that level of demand. In fact, in 2019, our ridership was slightly higher than in 2018, which was reversing a downward trend. Uh, the world looks, as um, uh, Dan Blankenship mentioned earlier in this meeting, the world looks a lot different now, um, and we're pretty excited that we have the engagement of citizens of the advisory committee and technical working group representing um, folks throughout the district on our reimagine RTD team as well as consultant resources to help us figure out how to move forward on our system optimization plan which is our shorter term now probably four five six years out um, redesign of our services, as well as our mobility plan for the future, which is intended to identify long-term strategies between now and 2050 to address future mobility needs for the region. So that, in a nutshell, is what Reimagine RTD is trying to really focus on. This graphic depicts what's kind of within the box and outside of the box uh, in terms of Reimagine um, scope and um, what we're intending to look at. And so just wanna give you a feel as to what we have covered to date. We've looked at some of um, the issues that you have already thought about and talked about even in your discussions today regarding demand, what our demand looked like at least pre-COVID. We had a very good grasp and um, of, of what our demand looks like. Supply, fare box revenues, revenue sources, and have had some really good discussions with our stakeholders, with the public and others regarding RTD's core purpose, our outcomes, guiding principles to lead our shorter term system optimization plan, a redesign of RTD services in the nearer term uh, because of COVID impacts probably a few years out and um, our longer term mobility plan for the future. So this slide, depicts that, that engagement process I, des I described, the involvement of our RTD board, our technical working group, our advisory committee, public and stakeholder engagement and input, um, leading to um, decisions on reimagine within that two year or so time frame. So one of the things that's garnered a lot of attention and interest with our board, with stakeholders and others, um, are the trade-offs and, um, and interplay between focusing our resources on social equity and community, which we hear time and again is a high priority from our advisory committee, technical working group, from our citizens and our stakeholders, and service quality, geographic coverage, which is another key um, input that we hear as a theme from our stakeholders and from our board members and cost efficiency and service um, production. And so those are some of the things that we have been analyzing and discussing with our stakeholders. When we started out the process, we really asked, what does su success look like? Uh, is it competitive and reliable service? Yes, frequent service, um, ability to travel throughout the district, reducing emissions, Ability options for transit dependent populations really getting at that core of that equity and social equity issue. So I've mentioned it, we've engaged the public through a number of different mechanisms. Post COVID, it's looked a little bit different in terms of our, 
of our engagement, but we've been able to go to a lot of public as well as targeted outreach meetings to um, groups that traditionally are underrepresented and also have a real interest in what we're looking at, as well as engaging our advisory committee and technical working group, our board of directors, and kind of a meaningful dialogue and feedback to help form kind of what our priority should be our guiding principles as we move forward in developing a system optimization plan and that mobility plan for the future. Key takeaways from the public, reliability ranked number one by far, other top priorities, convenient stop location, equitable access, frequent service, um, equitable access kept coming up. Geographic access was also important from in terms of what we heard from the public. Our technical working group and our own board of directors um, talked to us and prioritized um, things such as service to equity populations, high frequency service, that geographic coverage um, focus as well, making sure that um, RTD has a transit backbone. And a key piece that we've really embarked on, um, both proactively and in discussions with partners, is exploring additional opportunities for local community partnerships to operate and pay for local service. How can we expand our reach by partnering with local jurisdictions? And um, uh, our board of directors have time and again also indicated not just a real interest in equity service, but a coverage system, a geographic coverage system to make sure that service is um, distributed throughout the metro area. We've had those discussions. We've been underway for close to a year um, and we've had to react as I've kind of alluded to and mentioned throughout my brief presentation here. Um, how do we respond to COVID-19 and that impact on RTD? We were in the midst of evaluating our current bus and rail services when the pandemic hit. Our consultant team quickly transitioned to help our service development teams as um, they went through starting to identify what will our service in January of next year look like given our physical constraints, our financial constraints, um, given where our needs are in terms of what we're seeing in terms of service to equity populations, in terms of service um, to uh, uh, critical workers and critical institutions and making sure that we're able to do that. Also identifying where we have challenges in terms of um, ridership. So to today, today um, we're at a point um, where our board just earlier this month started talking with staff and asked us to take a pause for some length of time in the reimagine process. There's a number of things in play. The new general manager who we're gonna um, uh, know very soon and what direction she wants to take and making sure that she gets up to speed. Um, coordination with you, the accountability committee and making sure that you and your feedback and your information is able to be taken into account. Um, really understanding COVID ridership and economic constraints and impacts. Input from our new board members. We have an election this year. We will have some new board members taking seats on the RTD Board of Directors in January of next year. And, um, and making sure, however, that we don't pause so long that we don't have a meaningful dialogue with stakeholders such as Dr. Cog and their work on their 2050 regional transportation plan. So we're taking a pause. We're gonna to continue to support that development of our service plan for January of next year. We've asked the consultant team to take a pause until the early part of next year so that those items that I just talked about, um, coordination with the accountability committee, a better understanding of COVID-19 impacts and what the path out of COVID-19 looks like. Coordination with the accountability committee. We don't wanna wait so long that we can't have a meaningful dialogue between those groups in a feedback loop. Um, and um, the capacity to really, so we're looking at the capacity to really re-engage with stakeholders, with the technical working group, the advisory committee, in the early part of next year. So that was my attempt at a, at a, a quick presentation. Thanks, Bill, that was very brief and very, uh, <laughs> on message. And I guess 
given that we're constrained in time, do we want to entertain any discussion or questions? I think um, what there's a couple of key questions. How do we get a hold of the data that's been produced by Reimagine so we don't reinvent the wheel? And how does this committee play pay weigh in on any changes that are going to be made um, going forward in this process? If I can take a first stab, if that's okay, Co-Chair Jones. Yep. All right. Um, so yeah, happy to share. We're happy to share any information, um, recent PowerPoints or, or information that we have prepared for Reimagine with this committee, and we will be happy to post it onto that public-facing um, site that we're working on to provide information to you in a timely manner. So we will work on um, getting some of the more recent presentations so that you can delve into it and cycle back with questions. In terms of a feedback loop, that's exactly why we don't want this pause to be too long. Um, February, March of next year, we really intend to start re-engaging with our advisory committee and technical working groups on those plans. And I would be happy to um, volunteer myself or my staff to come back with brief updates and to make sure that you're getting the information at the same time our advisory committee, technical working group, and board are getting information regarding that process. So you can provide that feedback to us. Great, thanks. Uh, I want to move us along to, to get the update from Lynn. Bill, I feel like I'm cutting off short. It may be that we want to circle back to this topic on our next meeting. Um, so Happy to do that if necessary. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Bill. Lynn, you were going to give us a brief update on where things stand with the general manager search process? Great. Um, and it is brief. We're kind of in between the, the pieces. We, um, the videos have been available. The surveys have been uh, cut off now so we can get the information. The board will get the information today. Thank you to all of you who um, viewed the videos and gave us feedback. Can we, I'm sorry. Can we remove the other things so I, we can see Lynn? Sorry to interrupt, Len. Oh, just yeah. PowerPoint. Thank you. I don't. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. I'll go ahead and talk. And, um, is that better? Not right. quite. No. Okay. We just need to, the full participants. Screen. We need to stop sharing. Yeah. Just stop no, sharing. Sorry. The, I, this is Bill Van Meter. I think I'm still sharing. I'm trying to quit that. Thank you. There you go. There you go. Thank All you. All right, back to you, Lynn. Okay. Great. Um, anyway, thanks for your feedback. It's it's not ideal hiring someone where we can't meet them first. It's not ideal not being able to have them come out and meet the public. Um, but it's what we can do. It's the world we have now. Um, those videos. Uh, I would just say that that uh, the board in addition to the 15 minute videos has spent two and a half hours interviewing each of the uh, finalists in two, two separate interviews. Um, so you know, what you get is a snapshot. There's a lot more there. Um, some people seem to have, I've gotten feedback from people, you know, verbally also, and, and uh, some people seem to think there's a big winner, although that varies with per, from person to person. And I would just say, you know, that there is a lot more information going to the board. I really think we have three excellent finalists. We've um, we've been talking to people in the industry and, uh, you know, our executive search leader, Greg Mosier, has been talking to people in the, even the last couple of days, and, and that's what we're hearing. So um, we're excited about it. Uh, the In terms of the videos, I just wanted to point out, um, too, that they were given a specific direction, which was to... Um, give their vision at 90 days and two, two years and five years on very specific things, finances, um, service, operations, um, uh, working with local governments and, and with our partners. So that's why you, you may see different different views there. So that's really my report. We, we meet this afternoon in executive session and then tomorrow night in executive session and we'll pick some pick our person that we would like to move forward and negotiate with and hopefully reach a contract with. If you um, have questions or comments now, I'm happy to take those. If you want to talk any further later, you're welcome to call Troy or me or your director. Um, hopefully most of you know who your director is, but 
Troy or I or, or uh, Ron or Doug can certainly um, make that available to you and be a good contact for you, I think, to, uh, to make. That's it. They were very impressive ladies. So thank you. Good. Yes, they indeed. Were, it's nice really to were. have three great options. Mm -hmm. Good. I'm so, glad to hear that feedback because that's how we feel. Thank you, Lynn, for that. I would suggest if anybody have it, has any follow-up questions, maybe they contact Lynn or Troy directly. And in the next 60 seconds, maybe Ron can give us a status update on the, uh, the consultant scope in RFP. Thank you, uh, Co-Chair Jones, I can. Uh, so the RFP for the on-call consultant services was posted on Friday. Uh, proposals are due from consultants on uh, September 2nd. Uh, we'll be able to, we'll get that information out to those of you that volunteered uh, to serve on our little advisory committee to help us select that consultant. Um, late that afternoon or first thing the morning of the third, we're gonna wanna have a, we'll convene that group very quickly uh, to kind of get your feedback and make a decision. Uh, our plan is to take uh, the decision to our um, Dr. Cog um, uh, Finance and Budget Committee um, at their September meeting so we can get a contract executed with the, with the consultant. That's my update. Awesome. Remind us who's on the um, subcommittee to help review. The, oh, uh, I knew you were going to ask me that. And I know that Sophie is, and I, oh, where's my notes from the last meeting? Who are Elise? It's you. Never mind. Never mind. But if anybody <laughs> doesn't know that they're on and is interested, I have, I have Sophie. Daya, Kristen, uh, and Kathy. Kathy. <clears throat> Am I? Kathy's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's who I wrote down. Is anybody else wanted to be a part of that that isn't on that list? Are we we good with that? So oh, I'm I'm already on it, but I'm just wondering if Ron, can you you mentioned those dates? Can you just send out a calendar hold or something so we make sure we Please. keep on our calendars? We will, we will do that right away. Thank you, Sophie. Thank you. So it is 10 a.m. I want to respect people's time, but if anybody in the next 10, 20 seconds had something burning they wanted to share with the group, I want to create space for that. Madam Chair, if, if Elise, if this is Doug, just real quick. I had internet problems all morning. I apologize. And I want to thank Ron for, for picking up where, where I left off. Um, but I, I did want to make sure that in the email that we sent out with the agenda that you guys recognize, and apologize if this has already been talked about, that there was a link in there, um, which was a portal to RTD, some of the background in, information. So if you missed that, please go back to the, to the email that we sent out associated with the, with the agenda. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. And thanks everybody for a great meeting. We covered a lot of territory and we're off to the races. So thanks. Right. Thanks for your participation. Thanks, thanks co-chairs. You guys did a great job. Thank you guys. Thank you. Great Bye. Day. Bye everybody. Bye. Thank you.